We're continuing in our series. This is kind of day, day two, um, sermon two, from a series that uh, we're, we're calling Mere Christianity. And um, I'm excited about it, obviously. I, I like this guy, C.S. Lewis, but it's not a study of the book. It's more of an exercise of a project that he kind of took on where he did a series of radio broadcasts trying to get at the, the thing, the essence of Christianity, to distill it down to this thing that he had found so convincing that it pulled him, even though, albeit a little reluctantly, into the faith. Um, you know, as, as we begin, I hope you guys, this uh, quiet retreat that we're doing, let me just make a second little plug to say, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be so good. Um, my dear friend, Father Francis, is going to be leading some of our times together, but there's space in it to just be still, to rest, to take a sort of divine nap. <laughs> I just came up with that, but, but <laughs> I, it should be a spiritual discipline, I think, but um, the, the discipline of napping, but um, anyway, it should be just a wonderful time to be uh, filled up, to spend time with God, to spend time with some people in our church, so, um, so please consider that. Um, I'm also sort of, if I'm totally honest, I'm reeling from some news this week that's been difficult. Um, Kelly Slater got knocked out of the WSL for like the first time, like the, um, he didn't make the cut. And see, like he's kind of my age, so as long as he's competing, I sort of still think I got a shot. <laughs> but um, so it's like a death of a vision for me in all of this, but, um, and Bill Dahlke, I know we're grieving that, but uh, it's the way it goes. <laughs> um, as we shift gears here, um, this idea of mere Christianity, I, I love the project that Lewis took on with this because he was looking for what he terms the HCF. Remember, we talked about this last week, the, the highest common factor. And um, we would say the highest common deno uh, denominator in America, but in Britain, the HCF, the highest common factor. Does anybody remember this from math? Yeah. Right, so I got a little sample problem. What is the HCF of 24, 36, and 84? 12. 12. 12, right? You're looking for the largest number that can go into all of those things, right? And you see kind of the, pro the this was the goal, to get at the thing that's like right at the heart, the thing that all of these things have in common. And what he did is he, he sent it out to an Anglican and a Presbyterian and a Methodist, and, and he, he basically said, can, can we agree on this? And, and everybody thought, well, I might add something, right? Some would say a higher emphasis maybe on prayer. Some would say maybe with the Holy Spirit. Some might say communion or the Eucharist. But they, they looked at this thing and went, Oh no, that's it, right? That's what's at the heart of this thing. And to me, I think, not only do I think that's helpful in us kind of finding a place of unity, but I think it's often so contrary to how we naturally think <laughs> that we have a tendency to look at faith through this critical lens to see what's different, to judge others based on what's missing. I think we, we swim in the waters of this culturally right now constantly finding what's wrong or what's flawed with the other view, instead of looking instead for where is there overlap, where does it resonate, how can I find unity amongst my fellow believers. And I think that Lewis was kind of unique in his ability to speak into this because he was a fairly recent convert, which meant he knew um, what it was like to be standing on the outside of it. And they asked him at a time where Europe was in turmoil, it was the beginning of World War II, to speak this message of, of mere Christianity, to become a place of stability and for the people there. And I think in our world sometimes today, we, we feel as anxious or as fractured as ever. And what a time for there to be a project where we look at the heart of this faith, this thing that unites us, this thing that we can hold on to. And helpful for us to maybe even back up a little bit and consider, for those of us who have walked this road for a long time, what it, it kind of is like standing on the outside looking in. 
getting back, distilling this down to the essence, remembering. It's been said that most of the time we don't need some new idea. We need to be reminded of the old ideas that are true. And Lewis, as he talks about his process, I, I like how he's so honest about his reluctance to come in. That, that he called himself the most reluctant convert. And he says it like this. He says, you must, must picture me alone in that room in Maudlin, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. <laughs> and it's beautifully written, the, the authenticity of that. But what is he getting at? The, 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 there was a part of him that had to yield, a part of him that was resisting. And maybe some of you can relate to that in thinking about faith. Uh, that truth comes and, and reality comes upon us and, and it's, it's not ours to control or decide. It, it takes a sort of surrender. There's a posture of humility required to grow in truth. And Lewis, he realized that he was wearing this resistance like a suit of armor <laughs> that he was Im invited to remove, to in a sense lower his guard. And so as he writes this, as he writes kind of from the outside in, what I love is, is this thought of us kind of entertaining the same thought. Because the world that he sees is the world that we see. And he started with this idea of contingent truth. Now that sounds like a big term, but it's, it's really quite simple. That if truth is contingent, if, if a truth is contingent, it means it's dependent upon something else. For instance, let's say you walk into your house and you lay your keys down and then you go into another room and you come back and your keys have moved, right? You, you start deducing, somebody moved my keys. Or maybe I moved them and I just don't remember where I put them. Maybe there's some sort of ghost that moved my keys. But you know this for sure, your keys didn't move themselves, right? We know this, that that implies some other truth, something else behind it, something that had moved it. And this is a little bit of a re, kind of a continuation of what we talked about last week, but where Lewis saw one of the first unavoidable contingencies is that we live in this universe in motion, that we all start there. Nan sent me some photos today from an article from space where it's all these pictures of the earth from a huge distance, this tiny little planet out there moving at, at an enormous speed through the cosmos. We, we all start with this universe, with this reality here. And what we find is a universe that, that didn't just pop out of nowhere, it, it somehow started at some point from somewhere, we know this. I mean, not everybody, I guess, would admit to that. Some might think that it just is possible that this contingent truth is just the baseline. But even the, the famous philosopher Bertrand Russell was saying, and he was a staunch atheist, said there had to be a beginning to all of this. And a lady said to him, no, 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 we know this, that the universe is sitting on the back of a turtle. Have you heard this story? <laughs> and Bertrand Russell said, oh yeah? what's the turtle standing on? <laughs> and she famously said, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> but, but this idea, right? Like turtle after turtle after turtle, right? You're going, where is the ground floor in all this? Where is the starting point? We live in this universe that's in motion, but it had to begin somewhere. And not only that, when we look at it, we find something that should be startling to us. We find intricacy, we find design, we find beauty. There's another scientist that I enjoy listening to, his name's Brian Greene, and he's a string theorist. 
And Brian Greene does this, he has this TED talk that you should go back and listen to if you want to listen to a theoretical physicist. But he, he talks in there about how the universe has got these, these 21 different numbers, these forces behind it, the weak force, the strong force, the force of gravity, all of these, he's saying these dials, picture them like dials, where if you bumped any one of them, if you breathed on it too strong, the universe would go away that we have this universe that's like fine-tuned. And, and he's not saying this from a religious standpoint. He's not saying this from a philosophical standpoint. He's saying it just from a simple point of observation going, wow, the precision in order for there to be planets, in order for there to be matter that congeals, in order for any of this stuff to happen, there's precision. But not just that. He looks at the universe and he says, there's elegance that as physicists are studying the universe, seeking to understand its complexity, they're following this elegance in the design. Another physicist that I've read, Frank Wilczek, talks about beauty as a guiding principle of science. That's just wild, right? That he says this, the guiding principle in my work is beauty. This is a physicist. Beauty is a guide to the truth, and a beautiful theory is more likely to be correct than an ugly one. Nature uses aesthetics as a tool to select what's beautiful and therefore meaningful and therefore worthy of our attention and effort. So I work on beautiful questions, and I encourage others to do the same. Did he see what he did there? Nature uses aesthetics as a tool, right? And you're like, okay, come on. Nature freely chooses to use beauty as a, right? You're like, come on, you can't smuggle that in, right? That the beauty is there, and what he wants to say is like, well, it's just the nature doing this thing, right? But you go, it, it implies something much deeper about the universe. When Paul looks at it and he says that we can di discern God's attributes, what are we discerning? Artistry in the design. Power, of course, elegance, but this creativity that's in there. Understanding this fact. See, if you're, if you're not a believer, you still have to grapple with that truth, the beauty, the intricacy, the elegance of the universe. Lewis sets that contingency aside and he says, but there's another one, another contingent truth. Remember this from last week is morality. That not only do we have this beautiful creation, but we have these creatures who seem to know in their hearts this sense of right and wrong. And not just that, but whatever that is, they, they expect it of others, right? It's not just their preference, but that there's somehow some sort of justice or fairness that holds us all in line. And not just that, but they break their rule, right? My example last week was the intersection of Thalia and Glenary. Right? Some of you broke that this morning on your way here. Right? Like, I'm just going to go. Forget it. I'm just going to go. I'm justified. Right? And you're like, ask that police officer over there, and he's going to be like, you're not. Right? This, there's this sort of law out there of morality that holds us in check as well. And for Lewis, this reluctant convert, he's looking at these two things, and he's, he's trying to hold kind of these truths at bay. Because as long as he does, he gets to just do whatever he wants to do. He's able to behave freely. He's not held accountable. But he's realizing, no, if these things are true, then there's a sort of behavior that's expected of him, a way that he needs to respond. Paul, another reluctant convert, puts it like this in Romans 2. He says, therefore you have no excuse, O oh man, Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you would escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? not knowing that God's kindness is meant 
to lead you to repentance. That if these things are true, if there is a, not only a design of the universe, but that morality is also a reflection of that design in the heart of God, maybe it holds me accountable. Now, I want to hold those two, and I want to mention a third that I want to add to this, because I think the overlap of these three points us in a powerful direction. You have the universe, you have morality, but then you have this other contingent truth that we're going to call, and I might lose you, a few of you here, but we're going to call this the existential crisis. And all I mean by that is this sense of man looking for meaning, for purpose in life. And it's a bizarre question. I remember listening to a TED talk forever ago with Rick Warren. And it was right when Ted was kind of getting off the ground. And Ted was like, at that point, this real like sort of intellectual thing. And Rick Warren came on there and he's like, look, I'm not an intellectual, right? But he's like, well, I'm being interviewed because I've written the book that's most widely published, right? Purpose Driven Life. And they were like, well, tell us about that. What, what do you think that, you know, what has that taught you, that book's success? And he said, well, I think we can safely say that just about everybody is looking for purpose and meaning in their life. Isn't that interesting? Everybody. That we in this world see this world of design, this world of virtue, but also this struggle in men's hearts with meaning, this deep desire to know and understand, to live a life that matters. I like how the author of Ecclesiastes put it, puts it. He says that God has made everything beautiful in its time and he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. That, that all of men are living with this deep ache for eternity in our hearts. All of us struck by this beautiful truth and yet living in a world where we realize that it's so much beyond our ability to comprehend. And this question was a question for Lewis. I think it's a question for us. What do our lives mean and do they matter? I was listening to a talk this week where the person was saying all of us long, not just for a story or a narrative for our life, but we long for one that has a good ending. All of us for our life looking for what is the significance of what we've done? What is, has our life made a difference? Has it mattered? But with this longing for a sense of completion, for a finality, and these questions that men wrestles with, this awareness of the world that we're in, these truths of morality in our hearts, this longing to live a life of meaning point us to, in a direction that when we look at these truths, we see them in a way that overlaps. And at their center, is there an answer that ties these things together? The scientist is just going to say all these things can be explained by matter in motion. That the things of beauty, the longings and the desires, that all these things are just basically particles in our heads that are bouncing around in our skulls. And that's possible, right? They, they could be right. But does it speak to these deep truths? Does it unite these questions? Does it pull them together? I remember reading a, a philosopher when I was in grad school, writing on human consciousness. And he was a materialist. He didn't believe that there could be anything outside of the system. It was a closed system. And so he was talking about freedom and what this means. And he, he came to the conclusion at the very end of the book going, I guess that consciousness and freedom are just an illusion. And I thought, I wonder if your wife buys that excuse. <laughs> You know, one thing when Dr. Kim is speaking eloquently to this 
hall of academia. Another thing when she's like, take the garbage out. And he's like, hey, it's not even a choice for me, right? I don't even have the freedom. All of this is an illusion. And she's like, take it out, right? The, the, the thing, as we try to explain these things, it's just an interesting thing how, how science comes up with an answer, but it's sort of an unsatisfying answer. That the things that we find most deep and most beautiful become just sort of this byproduct of creation. When we know something much more true, I think, just naturally, that no, these are the reasons why we live. We live for beauty, we live for virtue. We live for lives of deep meaning. And yet in reality, we know too that all of us have broken that in some way. That we've failed to live up to our own standards, let alone God's standards. All of us have need of repentance. All of us have need to, to surrender. All of us have need for forgiveness. And that was what Lewis was refusing. That was what he was trying to hold at bay. In a similar way, we know this from, from Paul, who wrote most of our New Testament. And Saul, a persecutor of the church, was, was adamantly opposed to this new gospel being taught. And he confronts this reality. Christ confronts him on this road as he's going in pursuit to persecute and speaks to him saying, why are you persecuting me? Jesus meeting him on that road. And when Paul recounts this testimony a second time later in Acts, he, sa he adds a verse to it. He adds a little sentence to it. It says, 2614, when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And do you know what that means, kicking against the goats? It, they would, like if you were driving a team of oxen, you would have this stick that you'd poke it with whenever it got stubborn and refused to go. And so that stubborn oxen stops in its tracks and you, you give it a little prod, you goad it. But sometimes that oxen would kick back against that goad and inflict more pain upon itself. And here we see Paul looking back and going, this is what he was doing, that this God was pursuing. And in his resistance, he was injuring himself. And this God that pursues... This idea to me is one of the most beautiful and convincing things about what we celebrate here today. This God that comes after us and invades our world and pursues us. And goads, some of these goads are moments of conviction where we see our own hypocrisy and are confronted. But other times it, it sort of comes in from a different direction where all of a sudden we find ourselves kind of on holy ground. And I wonder if you've experienced something like this in your own life. I think one of the reasons why I'm excited to take you to Valermo to this abbey is because it's this place where I feel like God has invaded my world, where I've come there in a place, well, oftentimes when I'm feeling exhausted and feeling like I'm struggling. I can think of a time sitting there in prayer and writing in my journal, like this is as far as I can go, <laughs> right? If anything's gonna happen this week, you're gonna have to show up. And then feeling this sense of God's presence there with me in a way that I couldn't explain, a comfort and a warmth. I felt like a cat sitting in a little beam of light and I remember not wanting to move. I didn't want it to go away. That God has this way of not just leaving us out there to figure it out for ourselves. He comes and he finds us. 
I remember leaving there to go meet with some friends for prayer and afraid that like as I got up to move that I was going to leave that presence behind and yet it came with me as I went. That sense of God's comfort and nearness. I wish it was a formula. I wish I could just make that happen anytime I wanted. But God has this way of sort of selectively showing up just when I need it. I think of other times where I've prayed for people and felt all of a sudden an overwhelming love, a love that surpassed my own. I felt this love come on me and I think, oh my goodness, God, do you love me that much? These ways that this God pursues, that some of those goads can be pricks of conviction, but as Paul just told us, often it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. For Lewis, it was joy. He had these longings in his heart. He saw the creation and the universe. He understood morality and his hypocrisy. But the thing above all that he couldn't get away from was joy. That every once in a while it would come and he didn't understand it. But he knew that it was the thing worth pursuing. The thing worth living for. Psalms 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I just love that. I, I love this idea of goodness and mercy following after us. Jeremiah 31, 3, The Lord appeared to him from far away. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've continued my faithfulness to you. Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I think this is what to me is unbelievable, is that we're not just sitting here with reflections of what's out there. We find a God who comes, a God who pursues, a God who chases after us. Lewis, when he was struggling with this, he he would say, how could we get to know the author above all? This would be impossible. This would be like Hamlet meeting Shakespeare. It can't happen. And later he realized, no, that's actually a good analogy. Hamlet could meet Shakespeare if Shakespeare wrote himself into the story. Is that interesting? And where he's going to go next, where we're going to go next, is, is this idea of why Jesus so uniquely answers this revelation. That in this world where we seek meaning, in this world where we know we need forgiveness, in this morning, in this moment, surrounded by God's glory. What we have is God revealing his heart more specifically by writing himself into the very heart of it. In Romans 5.8, it says, but God shows his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And in 1 John 4.9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. These truths come to us like revelation and call us to something greater. And I think for all of us, it's a chance to examine our own hearts and to ask, is there anything that holds us back in our belief? Is there a way that I resist? Is there a way that I am reluctant? Is there brokenness in my own heart that I hide? Are they longings in my own life that I'm leaving unanswered? And as we go further into this mere Christianity, we're going to get right to the heart of this in Christ and what he did, how God so brilliantly answers this. But God does it in such a way that he doesn't just answer each individual question, but he ends up exposing us to a much greater reality. That that eternity put in our hearts 
is the reality that we find ourselves called into. That God doesn't just fix the brokenness, he transforms us into a new creation. And that we're not just forgiven of the wrong we've done, but we encounter the grace of God, a grace that surpasses and fills our lives with joy and meaning and purpose. So some questions for you as we close this morning. Question one, have you experienced a moment that felt sacred or divine? Have you experienced a sense of God's presence with you? How would you describe it? One of my professors used to also always say, what was the texture of that moment like? And I love that word, the texture. When God has come and he's met you somewhere, what is the texture of that moment like? Can you remember it? What did it smell like? What did it feel like? Question two, have you asked yourself why? What was it that God wanted you to see in that moment? What does it tell you about who God is? I feel like those moments are filled with so much meaning. It's God saying, this is my heart. This is who I am desiring to be known. And number three, have you ever found yourself resisting God's revelation? The answer is yes. Are there times in your life where you choose to pretend God isn't there? What would it cost to invite God into all areas of your life? And this is what God wants from us. More of our heart, more of our life surrendered responding to this beauty and this truth, to this goodness, with hearts that are humble and open and ready to receive. Would you stand with me? We will have people down front. For any of you that would like prayer, we have got a delicious meal for you outside, so please stick around, join in, enjoy some good food and fellowship. But as I leave you today, let me leave you, as always, with a blessing that God would bless you and keep you, that God would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you, and that he would lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. God bless you. Thanks for being here, you guys.